right? It's about 7.04. I'll let people catch up as they get in. Hi, everybody. I, my name is Jill Vanning. I work for the Little Shoe Public Library. I'm here with Tom Wenzel, who's a master gardener. This is Master Gardener Presents. Um, we're doing food preservation. We have today Karen Dickrell from the University of Wisconsin-Madison Extension. And we have David DiPietro, who is a master food preserver. Is that right? So right. they're going to master what, gardener. <laughs> and a master gardener. Um, we're going to talk about what's new in food preservation, um, the newest updates, all the new things about it that you need to know. So again, at, we're going to do question and answers at the end. We'll go through the presentation, and then at the end, we'll do question and answers. Along the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat box, or there's a Q&A box. That's where you can put your questions, and we'll address them at the end. And I'll leave it to you, Karen. OK, thanks so much. And thank you to the Atagami Master Gardeners um, for, for sponsoring this program. Um, David DiPietro, I call him emeritus because we no longer have master food preservers. Sadly, that went away when we transferred to UW-Madison. But he is a very um, knowledgeable um, individual who practices what he preaches. So I'm very fortunate to have um, David tonight along to share his experiences and, and knowledge. So um, why preserve foods? Um, we're gonna talk about that a little bit tonight. And I've had some really interesting questions this year with COVID and people, more people are gardening as many of you know, and they're reverting back to things that they remember in their childhood or earlier years of what grandma did or their mother did. And I'm a little concerned with some of the things that I'm hearing of what people are doing. So David and I are going to share with you tonight what the updates are. It's like a 101 of what kinds of things we should be looking for in the best practices for the safest um, food for our families. We're going to talk about the basic food preservation guidelines and then we'll share with you resources that are available to help you preserve your food safely. So we're gonna do a little poll and um, we'll give you a couple minutes to do this. So if you can, there's three questions and I ask that you, you can, that some of these are multiple choice. So what have you done for food preservation techniques? The second question is, which of the techniques are you comfortable with? And then the last is just to tell us what, where you live. So we get a little bit of the geography and the lay of the land. And with food preservation, there's a reason for asking that as well. So if you could all, if you've got a computer, I'm not sure if you're on phone, if you'll be able to um, participate. Sorry about that. But I think you can do it on a tablet or computer. So I'll give you a couple minutes. So you said in the chat that they're able to do it on a phone. So if you have a phone, oh, you yeah. should use the poll. <laughs> okay. So no excuses. <laughs> Charlie said hitting submit doesn't work. You might want to try again, maybe. <laughs> Charlie, I don't know why it wouldn't work. Somebody else is having trouble with the, um, I don't see the questions. Is the, do they have to click on the poll to see it? Is that what they do? Yeah, they click on the answers. Okay, it looks like you have to answer all three questions and then hit submit. Yeah, yeah. you have to do all three, yes. And one of the reasons I also ask where you live is a couple of weeks ago, I did a program for a Fox Valley group. And when I got to talking about altitudes and things, I was asking what counties they lived in. And three of the participants said, well, we live in Canada. I went, oh, well, um, <laughs> I don't know the altitude for Canada. And then there was someone on from Puerto Rico and someone from Virginia. It was just interesting. So those of you that are marking other, we'll do the best we can, or we can talk to you later about um, so someone says they don't see it. I think you, along the bottom of your Zoom, you should maybe have a poll there, a button for the poll. It should be popping into your screen. 
I'm on a desktop, I don't see it. Is it in the Zoom? It's somewhere in the Zoom. <laughs> yeah, we've got, well, almost 41, 46 have participated. So it's sounding like some people may not have the right version maybe of Zoom. Well, this is giving us a start. So I'm gonna end the polling. Two people raised their hand. Oh, someone said Chromebook might not have the poll capabilities. That's possible. Oh. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I'm going to end the polling just to see, you know, where we are and I'm going to share. So it looks like most of you have done freezing. 63% um, blanching, hot water bath 61, followed by pressure canning and dehydration. We have a couple steam canners. Seven of you have used a steam canner. None of you have used the oven canning. That's, that's good. That's good. Or the dishwasher, that's good because let me tell you, I have stories to share of people that have done this. Wash machine to clean pickles, okay, we're being honest. Um, there's some concerns about that. Um, and then which of the following techniques are you comfortable with? Um, so freezing, you're pretty comfortable with that. Hot water bath, pressure canning, looks like you are in dehydrating. More dehydrating than the pressure canning. And that, that's not new. I, I, many people have reservations about using a pressure canner. Um, and um, because there've been stories of things that have happened over time and explosions. And one lady I know in one county east of us got a brand new kitchen because she was using her pressure canner for something other than pressure canning. And the lid was on and it exploded because it hadn't gotten the pressure. So she had tomato soup embedded in her ceiling. Anyway, so, okay, that, that this really helps us, both Dave and I, to know kind of when we're talking who we've got online and um, the kinds of things that um, you know about. So, so thanks. So we've got people from all over Northeast Wisconsin and so we'll stop sharing and we'll move on now with the, with the, the rest of the presentation. So thanks for sharing your, your background. So why do we preserve food? Well, we do it so that we increase the shelf life of food. So right now, um, Tom was telling us he's over, he, he was overwhelmed last week with peaches and, and today he's very grateful because he's got grapes that he's grown. And, and peaches that he grew. So you want to extend the shelf life because you can only eat so many peaches and so many grapes. Um, and that happens with a lot of other vegetables and fruits that come in. You know, you don't always control mother nature. So you can, you can enjoy it um, throughout the course of, of the year. It's for convenience. Um, many people enjoy to have the, the canned goods available. You don't have to go grocery shopping for it. It, it's right there and, and you know what the ingredients are and you can retain the nutritional value of the food that you're, you're preparing. It also sometimes improves how the food tastes because you made it yourself and you know what's in it and you know what, if any preservatives of what you used and how you made it and um, it, just, it just helps you and, and your family to really appreciate the fruits of your labor. You grew it, you um, preserved it, and now you're enjoying it um, and the flavors. And because it's fun. I have one friend who's a teacher and during the, the summer, she loves to do food preservation. And then she said, she it all goes down in the basement and she has this wonderful inventory in her paint pantry of all the things that she's preserved over, over the summer. And then, um, she said, so when she has a bad day at school, sometimes she'll just go down in the basement and look at what she's been able to achieve in life and it's canned goods. <laughs> she just enjoys it and many people do. It's kind of fun to do. Some families take this on as a project and they have a salsa day or making your tomato sauce um, and, and really have fun with it. So there's lots of different reasons why we preserve, preserve our foods. So there's basically three heat processing um, strategies that you can use. The first is blanching. So that's a short heating to stop the enzymes, soften the tissue and prevent any loss and remove any air from the tissue. So mo most often that's done with um, when you're going to freeze your vegetables. I know some people have called and told me, oh, I just throw the peas in the freezer. I put them in some freezer bags and they're in the freezer. 
And then they say, but then after a couple months, they get this off flavor. Well, did you blanch them? Oh, no, I didn't know you had to do that. And so that's what happens when you blanch. It stops the enzyme production of the vegetable. So that, that heat is very, really important to preserve not only the flavor, but the textures as well. We also can use heat processing with pasteurization. So that's a mild heat tra treatment that's used to stop enzymes to decrease the growing of bacteria. So we find that in milk, juices, pickles, and some jams. And then we have canning, and that's the high heat to destroy your harmful microbes in your meats and vegetables. And we're going to going to talk about the different kinds of equipment you use. And we have fermentation, um, and that's like your cabbage and your pickle products, so it takes time for fermenting. And I know if you've been reading a lot about nutrition and good health, we're being told to have more fermented foods because it's good for our bodies, it's good for um, our systems to, to deal with some of that, eating some of the fermented foods. We have the acidification, so the addition of acid to lower pH and to raise the acidity. So our example, that's, and this has been around for probably 20 plus years, is when you're doing tomato products, whether you're pressure canning or hot water bath, you need to add lemon juice. Um, now vinegar, you would think would be the ticket, but it doesn't do the ticket for tomato products. You can use lemon juice or citric acid for those tomato products. Vinegar, you may add to increase some of the acidic levels in things like your pickles and some of those products. And that's why it's really important to follow the guidelines and the directions and the recipes, if you want to call them that, of how to preserve your food safely. So there's two types of canning. There's the boiling water bath canning. So that's um, for fruits and acidified foods. So some of your tomato products can be done in the water bath. Um, but the pressure canning is for your meats and your vegetables that are lower in acid. So we'll be showing you examples of those pieces of equipment and what to do for that. And that this is where I, it's helpful for me to know where people um, are living because you need to adjust for your elevation for the most part. So in Adegini County, the highest elevation is Mosquito Hill over by New London. So for the most part, we can just follow the guidelines that we have. But there are guidelines for elevation in many of the different resources that we have. And that's why going to some national kinds of resources and websites, which we'll make available to you is helpful if you don't live in this Northeastern Wisconsin area. And so easy to preserve has some information as well. This is out of University of Georgia. And so they talk about some of the um, elevations, as does the University of Penn State. So adjusting for elevation is important. So you have relatives out in Colorado. They need to look at a different elevation probably than what, um, for processing time with um, pressure canning, than what you're probably using. Oops, now David. Okay, so we're going to, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the uh, items that you're going to need. First, you're going to need jars. Uh, you want to use a good brand of jars. I myself uh, stay with either a ball or Kerr. Uh, they've been in the industry for, for a long time, probably well over 100 years. They have a good track record. Uh, you can reuse your jars, but you need to uh, inspect them for chips and cracks, especially around the ceiling edge. And what I do uh, each time I get some back or uh, take them out to reuse them, I'll run my finger around the edge just to make sure I don't feel any chips or cracks or things like that that are there. Because even a very small minute crack that or chip on there uh, could interfere with a, with a good seal. Okay, next slide. And uh, one of the things that you cannot reuse are the lids. Uh, the rings you can reuse Lids now, you, all you have to do is uh, wash them in the hot soapy water and then rinse them well, and then they can be placed on your product when you do a hot fill. Uh, Karen will talk about the uh, Tatler, our reusable lids in the, for a minute there. Right, um, if you see my little heading there, what's more scarce than toilet paper during canning season of 2020? Lids, believe it or not. And some of you have probably encountered that. 
Um, and we just had a news release from our Dr. Ingham in Madison um, talking about that. If you can't find the lids, perhaps then you need to think about um, freezing your foods if you have the freezer space or um, thinking about drying the foods. And we'll show that in a little bit too. These are Tatler lids. And if you can see, they've got these rubber gaskets that fit into the lid. And you can buy them in pint and quart. Their boxes, I think, look a little bit different now. This, this box is a couple years old now. But Wisconsin and Penn State, um, UW-Madison and Penn State did research on the Tatler lids to see how long and if there was a good seal with these, because these are reusable seals. Um, I don't know if you can find, you used to be able to find them at hardware stores and different stores in the Fox Valley area, but I did see them on Amazon and some of the other places where you can order them. So you can get these. And what they found in the testing is you can use them up to 10 times before you need to replace them. And you go, okay, it's a white top. How am I gonna remember which one I use this year and which one next year? Well, the way to do that is just simply use a permanent marker and maybe have a symbol or just a dash so that you're keeping track of how many uses you've used these for. Because after about 10 uses, the rubber gaskets do um, wear out. So that is one option for you to look for um, when it comes to lids. Okay, uh, next. Um, in uh, preserving, uh, some of the things we'll talk about later is, is where to find these uh, recipes. But uh, for this time of year, uh, there's still, apples are very plentiful, tomatoes possibly are, so you may be able to do a salsa, maybe do some sort of jam or uh, apple butter. Uh, peaches might still be around uh, in your farmer mar farm markets and things like that. Um, you want to be able to use produce that is uh, not overripe, but possibly could be at ripeness or peak ripeness and possibly a little bit under ripeness for the peak amount of natural pectin that the fruits, fruits will bring to your, uh, to your recipe. Uh, so later on, I'm going to talk uh, about the uh, sources for those recipes. And if you have any particular questions on a particular recipe, so uh, this summer already I've done strawberry, raspberry, uh, peach, jams, salsa, and blueberry jam so far. I haven't done any, any jellies, haven't done anything with the, with the dehydrator yet either. But we could talk more about specific recipes and sources of recipes uh, later on in, in this presentation as, as we go forward then. And then Karen, I turn it back over to you. No, you do the still about the seals, I think. Oh, okay. Well, I could I could do that. Uh, okay, uh, the vacuum seal is going to be very important. So when that when the uh, you go through either your boiling water bath or your pressure canner, the lid needs to pop down and stay down after the uh, after your uh, product has uh, cooled and uh, returned to uh, room temperature. Uh, if you have any jars that don't seal or pop up, uh, those can should be put back in the either in the refrigerator or uh, or freezer. Uh, so use those uh, immediately, but don't try and store those on your uh, on your on your shelf. So the vacuum seal is is uh, very important because what happens as the product is heated up, uh, that air that's in your headspace is going to expand. And that's going to evacuate from your product, and as it cools, it uh, it shrinks back down. So it it forms that vacuum seal, which then uh, prevents any air or contamination to get back into your product after you spent all that time uh, processing it. And as Karen said, uh, this is uh, it's it's sort of a, a something that you have to love to do uh, if you're looking for a hobby or something like that. It it uh, it has its uh, challenges. And uh, it sometimes has disappointments that you know you spend a lot of time and it doesn't turn out as well as you thought it uh, should or, or could. But again, I always look at those as well. I look back as to what I did or what I didn't do as, as best I should have done or found the recipe that may have missed something and then learn from that and move on. Uh, I've never lost any product in, uh, in the processing. So things that don't seal, like I said, you could put those in, uh, in your refrigerator or freeze them and then use them later as, as fresh then. So 
how do I know if it's sealed? Um, the venting occurs in small amounts throughout the processing time. So um, the headspace is really important. So those directions that we're going to talk about in a little bit, um, talk about a headspace for the different products that are being canned. And so when you fill the jar, you use a jar filler or whatever. This is a, a neat one because it's got the, mark the markings of one inch or half inch um, headspace. So some products you need to have a quarter inch headspace, some half inch, some three fourths. But you know you can also measure that and kind of eyeball it. But this is a science, and um, that's why the headspace is so important. As the jar cools after processing, <laughs> the contents shrink, and that's how that vacuum forms. And so it's a state of negative pressure in the jar, and the sealing compound on the underside of the canning forms around the top of the jar and prevents the air from re-entering. When the vacuum seal forms, the little curve towards the jam or the jar to going down. And when you open a sealed jar, there should be a rush of air to equalize that pressure. So sometimes people will use what we call an open kettle method, and they'll heat up everything in a big pot. Maybe they'll make um, tomato sauce. And so it's all heated up, and they put it in the jars, and they look at the headspace, and then they put the lids on and it seals. And then a couple days, maybe weeks, maybe a month later, I get a phone call at the office and my tomato products are bubbling and they're, they're looking funny or they're starting to change colors. Or one lady called once about how to get tomato stains out of a white carpet in her living room and I had to backtrack and say, how did the tomato stains get there? Well, she was storing the tomato jars on her white carpeting, so it'd be out of the uh, draft of air, and it started to work because she hadn't pressure canned or hot water bath that, that product. And so, yeah, it sealed, but it didn't seal the way it should have with that constant heat temperature in either a hot water bath or pressure canning. So it's really important to make sure that you're following these guidelines for the best product after you've gone through all that work and the safest product for your family. So don't harm your family with these canning methods, which is the boiling water canning of low acid foods. Like a woman called and said, how long do I um, boil the beans so that I can just do it in a hot water bath? And I said, I, I can't tell you because we don't have a safe methodology. And I found out later she also called a couple other um, people in other counties that do similar work that I do. And my colleague in Sheboygan County called me one day and she said, this lady called me and she wanted to boil her vegetables so she wouldn't have to do it in the pressure canner. And I said, she couldn't do it. And she said, that's what all you extension people tell us. I said, well, yep, <laughs> we're doing our job. We don't want you to get sick. That open, open kettle canning um, is, a, is a method that I know my grandmother used um, and many of our grandmothers did um, and for fathers probably as well, not just mothers, but fathers as well, but it's not a recommended methodology. Oven canning is not recommended either. Um, and when I did a program for some county employees, we had some men that were canning venison in the oven so when the football game was starting, they put it in the oven. And when the football game was over, they figured it's done and they took it out of the oven and um, their venison was canned. And as I shared that research and methodologies of how to, to, to do canning with meat, it was like, oh, come on, Karen, really? I went, yeah, really, you need to pressure can it. And it's usually 75 to 90 minutes, depending on what you are pressure canning. So again, it's great to have that heritage and the stories. And we used to have a food specialist that would say, when she'd get a question about oven canning, she'd say, now, what is your name again? I never did this, but she would, she could get, she could do this. She'd ask, and then they'd tell her, and she said, I'll be watching the obituaries for your name. I was like, whoa. But that, that is pretty serious. But sometimes that, that's what takes people's attention to realize that this is a science and we want the best, safest food supplies possible. 
So steam canning, a couple of you did say that you are steam canners. This is something that had some research again at UW-Madison with Dr. Ingham and she had some um, PhD students in food science that did the research. And it's been around for a long time, but we weren't so sure if it really was the safest method. So steam canning works best for your jams and fruits and items with a shorter period of process time. The steam canners are relatively easy to find. They're lightweight and they, they're not as heavy to transfer. Um, and if you have a glass top stove, more than often, it, it has a pretty good heat um, connectivity. So it works on uh, most of your glass stoves, but don't go saying, well, Karen Dickrell and David DiPietro said you could do this on my glass top stove. Please check your warranty, check your, um, your stove manual to see what they say about using um, different kinds of food preservation equipment on it. Some will write out say, no, sorry, can't use it because the, the glass may, may crack and they don't stand behind it in a warranty. So steam canner, this is one example of a steam, atmospheric steam canner. They um, have different kinds of models out there. Um, basically, it's got a vent on the side. Some of them have um, vents on two ends. Um, and so you um, put water in the bottom of the steam canner and then you have a rack that your jars sit on. So the jars never sit directly on the, in the water on the bottom but the water may come up the sides of the jar. And so there's side vents and the racks, but they will vary with the styles of steam canners that you um, might find. Again, because you only have a small amount of water in there, you can't do things like tomatoes that need 45 minutes or 25 minutes because it would boil away all the water and then you'd have a real mess. So things that need shorter time periods work really well with the steam canners. The hot water bath canner, now this one comes from the 70s. This was before, this is an old canner, but it's the one we have in the office. Uh, it's the one that we've used with our food preservation classes when we could have classes. Um, and your hot water bath canners, basically it has a deep um, kettle and a cover, and you wanna make sure that it has a rack. You can see that this one's got water stains and it sometimes vinegar will take out those stains, but really, you know, it's a sign of it's being used. Um, so uh, use a rack for the jars in your hot water bath process for a couple of reasons. One is you don't want the glass jars, even if they're the jars that David shared with you, are created for um, food preservation in the high heat. Um, some of them may crack um, and it's, easy, it's easier to just pull the rack up and out of the canner so um, you can easily get it out of the, um, of the canner. Now you can use some, like there's a jar lifter that you can use that you would use to just lift the jar up and out. This is really hard not being in a kitchen, but um, you get the, the gist of it that you've got different equipment that you can use um, to lift the jars out. But still, you don't want the jars right on the bottom of the, of the pan. And again, check with your manufacturer if you have a glass top stove. If you have the electric coil stove or a gas stove, those are easier to regulate. The gas is the easiest to regulate of all. Um, electric coil, you're gonna have to be watching to make sure that the water stays at a boiling point. This is um, an electric hot water bath canner. They're kind of expensive, but if you've got some friends and family, you could buy it, um, chip in together. And it's kind of like a um, coffee maker. So this is, not used on top of your stove. The heating element is underneath. You can't really see it from the picture. And there's a rack that's important. There you go. So it, the canner sits on this heating element and um, that's how you get your water hot. And that's how you get your boiling water bath. And so you don't have to use it on a stove. So if you have a glass top stove, this works really well. So it has the spigot also. So when you're done with your hot water bath, you don't have to lift this heavy canner. You kind of get it over to where your sink is, where you can drain it and drain the water out. So it works nicely for those with the glass top so stove. 
Um, again, make sure that you're checking your warranties, but this is kind of expensive product. And I don't endorse, people will call me and say, well, which one should I buy? And I'll say, well, these are the ones that I've seen. And this is what I have seen. I, I don't know. I think there are some others out there. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a neat and it's handy because then you can use it for other things as well. Under pressure, I was looking for that song and I didn't find it tonight. But anyway, um, foods that are low in acid need to be pressure canned if the goal is to have a shelf stable item. Again, my phone calls are always interesting. There was a woman that called that had just gotten a pressure canner and she wanted to pressure can her, vegetable, her leftovers. So her thought was she would take her leftovers, put them in a jar and then pressure can them. So she was wondering how long do you pressure can leftovers? Well, that's not really the purpose of a pressure canner. There are pressure cookers that you can make your meals in. Those are generally smaller. There's a lot of different models on the market today, um, but a pressure cooker is different than a pressure canner. So your pressure canners, the ones that you use to preserve food so that you have food on a shelf for a year or more, or not much more, but a year, they come with either a dial gauge or a weighted gauge. Now the newer models are coming out with both. So that's really confusing people because they're saying, well, what do I have? as I've got a dial gauge and a weighted gauge. And in that model, those that are being produced now that are on the market, they're considered a weighted gauge and the dial gauge is just kind of a backup. So to show you, this is an old, we think this is over a hundred years old. It's an all American pressure canner that a woman, no one in her family wanted it. So she gifted it to the extension office um, so we have, um, this is an example of a really old pressure canner. And most people will say, well, that's too old. You can't use it anymore. Well, if you can get the dial gauge, and I test the dial gauge, if I can get that dial gauge to test and come true to the, the pressures that they need to be, you can use these. So don't think that grandma's old pressure canner needs to be thrown out. It just needs to be tested if it has a, a dial gauge. You can replace dial gauges for the most part. Some of the really old models that like the, they're different companies, they may not fit anymore. So don't put all your hope into it, but again, you know, you never know. Like last week, so I'm testing pressure canners at the office, but the office is closed. So people make an appointment and I go out to their car with my cart and they put their pressure canner on the cart and I go into the office and I test it and then I come back out and I tell them results. One of them that I tested last week, the woman had the original book um, in the box with, with the canner. And the last time she thinks that it was tested was 1959. So this was an old pressure canner. Um, but when I tested it, it was just two pounds off. So she can still use it if she adjusts knowing that her dial gauge is two pounds off. So these are very dependable canners um, and for the most part work, work really well. Um, one gentleman brought one in that wasn't maybe this old but was pretty old and it was all burned on the sides. And I went, how did this get all burned? And he said, well, I was pressure canning outside on an open fire. Oh, okay, well, we wouldn't recommend that either. Um, so, you know, there's all kinds of different kinds of methods and things that people do, but you really want to control the temperature as much as possible. His fire got so hot that the, the gauge is kind of burned and the dial was kind of stuck. And he thought maybe I could fix it and I, I can't. But, you know, he's still got a heavy duty kettle there, but just can't use it. So this is the um, dial gauge pressure canner. And so that's what um, I would test. Um, and then um, I'd also look to make sure, and all you need to do is to bring in the cover and the rubber gasket. And I just check the handle and just make sure that the gasket is still pliable and that the air vents are still open and they're not clogged. This is a weighted gauge, one example. There's a lot of different weighted gauge kinds of examples. So what this one is, 
is there's a five pound, a 10 pound, and a 15 pound. And that's what you put on your, um, on the top, depending on what directions you're using and looking at your timing. So some though have weighted gauges that kind of nest on top of each other. So the bottom one is maybe five pounds and you add another one and it's 10 pounds. And by having three weights on, it's 15 pounds. I don't need to test those pressure canners um, because the weights are pretty constant. Um, but I, if you want to bring it in, I can look at the handles and also check the gasket out. You want to make sure also that the bottoms aren't warped because if they're warped, you're not going to get a good heat contact on your heat source. So again, the key elements of a pressure canner include a rack at the bottom. And in this case, the gasket is white. Many times the gasket is black or brown. Um, when you're not using the pressure canner, it's advised that you take that gasket out of the lid and let it just sit in the bottom of your canner so it gets lots of air. So check your equipment out. So as I said, we will test pressure canner lids at our office for no charge. It's your tax dollars at work. Our office hours are 8 to 4.30. But now during COVID and with our office being closed, it's by appointment only. So I go into the office. I have to sign up to be in the office so people know liability that I'm there. And so um, we'll, we'll make it work. Um, and you can just call that number and it will um, forward to my cell phone here at my home office. And then we'll go over the process and procedures. Generally, I do the testing between 8 and 4.30 on Monday through Friday. So what is this? Well, it's a plane. It's a bicycle pump. Actually, it's how I test the pressure canner dial gauges. So on the left-hand side is where my calibrated tester goes, my gauge. And then in the far right there, you can kind of see it, um, a little spigot that's kind of sticking out. That's where I rest the, um, the pressure canner, the dial gauge pressure canner on that. And then I compare what the, rate, what the different poundage is from my tester that's been calibrated to yours. And then I'm pumping on the bike pump. And that's how I get to my 15, my 10, and my five. It's not very sophisticated, but it works. So, and now, as I said before, canners versus cookers, pressure canners and pressure cookers are not necessarily the same thing. To use a pressure canner, as a pressure canner, it has to hold at least four quart jars. So many of your smaller pressure cookers cannot do that. Pressure cookers are not recommended for home canning. If you buy an electric pressure canner, the only recipes that we recommend from extension that you prepare in that electric pressure canner are the ones that come with the, with the appliance. Because we have not tested the electric pressure canners and do not know if the recipes that we have tested with either the dial or the weighted gauges are going to be the same. So there's a limitation to some degree of buying the electric pressure canners, but for people that only do a little pressure canning and maybe don't have a lot of space, it is an option. Um, and then when all else fails, um, freezing is a great option and it looked like most of you are freezing. And as I mentioned earlier, blanching is needed for vegetables to get the optimum quality of your food and check with extension approved process timing. Fruits have different types of expectations required for the best quality. Um, and be sure to date your food so that you know what's um, in the freezer and when it was frozen. And so you kind of know the life of it because we do find um, freezer burn sometimes um, that happens with the food that's in the freezer too long. Your refrigerator freezer freezes okay, but it's not really ideal for long-term freezing. Um, it's just a different kind of, um, the temperature and the constant temperature isn't the same with that refrigerator freezer. 
So if you're planning to do a lot of freezing and you want to keep it for a certain longer period of time, we would re recommend either a chest or a upright um, freezer for those purposes. Um, this is the hot water blancher. And it, it actually wouldn't have to be this. It could be just a kettle with a colander in it, a metal one, not a plastic one. Um, and so that the water um, you, um, goes in the bottom kettle and then your vegetables go in the part, the part that has the holes there, the colander type thing. Um, and you bring the water to a boil, put the vegetables in. And then when that starts to boil again with the vegetables, that's when you start your timing. What's really important with blanching is that you have ice water available. So if it's three minutes for blanching for the vegetable, you have three minutes on ice because that's gonna stop the heat process and you won't get your soggy vegetables. Um, then we have food dehydration systems. And that again, you could do it if you lived in Arizona or some of our sun, well, I don't know now with all the smoke and all the other problems with that. Um, they're going to do much dehydrating outside, but solar sun drying is an option, not so much in Wisconsin, but you could use your oven. Um, it is an energy drain because you're supposed to have the oven door open and at a very low temperature. So what's best is to have um, a food dehydrator where you have circular air movement and you can vent the heat movement and it's relatively easy to do and it doesn't take a whole lot of time. So the stacking racks are neat, um, but sometimes people stack them, and you can get more of those stacking racks. The more racks you have, the longer it's gonna take to really dehydrate your food. So um, the lower the rack the numbers, the, the quicker you're going to get dehydrated food. And there's all kinds of different things that you can buy to add to your food dehydrators if you want to make different kind of gel and wraps and that type of thing. This is a square um, dehydrator, and that really works for products like your meat jerkies and things that are square and have a different kind of dimension of what you're working with. All choices. So David, you're going to talk about the recipes and how do we get started? Uh, yes. Uh, food, uh, food preservation is really a science, as Karen has been saying. Uh, Dr. Ingham in Madison is our uh, food scientist for the state of Wisconsin. So the uh, uh, face pre safe preserving website, which has all the recipes there have been tested uh, through the laboratory in the uh, University of Wisconsin, Madison. So that these are recipes that will hold up if you follow them to the letter. Uh, you do not want to get creative with these and start uh, ad living or modifying the recipes because then you uh, ha may have a questionable product that will have any type of uh, longevity or will be safety after it is preserved. So again, you wanna look at uh, uh, canning instructions that are from 1994 and, and later. And then um, also you wanna be careful where you get your information from. Uh, you could do a Google search and look for any number of recipes and you're gonna come up with all sorts of food sites that will give you different uh, recipes and recommendations uh, I would stay clear of, of, of some of these. And then, uh, Karen, the next slide then. So, um, I thought we were supposed to get a, a list of, uh, oh, okay, I'm out of, out of sync here. Okay, so uh, once, once you get started, you wanna assemble everything uh, that you're gonna be using. So uh, look at the recipe that you're, you're gonna be using. I'd say if you're gonna make making a, an apple butter, Okay, so you now you, you have your bushel basket of, of apples, but now you're gonna look at that recipe and all the equipment that you're gonna need to do that. So everything gets assembled ahead of time, make sure that everything is ready to go. Cause you start cooking down your um, apple butter, you're gonna start kneading your hot jars fairly quickly. So you don't wanna find out that you know, you're done cooking your apple butter and now you don't have your hot jars ready to be filled or you're looking for a funnel or you're looking for something to uh, get the air bubbles out. So you wanna make sure that uh, you have all your equipment, you read your recipe very closely, especially if you have not done this before, uh, that is very critical. 
Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I found, I could fold this up here, you might be able to see this, but this is on the back of the tray of a, a, a ball canning jars, and they have a very good checklist as to what to do uh, when you're going through a canning process. So as I said before, inspect all your containers. You wanna use brand new lids. Uh, if you're using a uh, pressure canner, you wanna make sure that your uh, gauge has been calibrated, your uh, rubber gasket is in good shape. Uh, and if you're using a dehydrator, you wanna make sure that, uh, that the trays are clean and ready to go. And if you're freezing things, you wanna make sure that you have your blancher ready, your ice bath ready uh, to go as well. Okay, next slide. Okay, so these are the uh, sources of uh, recipes that you could use. So the Wisconsin Safe Preservation Series, which Karen had held up before, the Ball Blue Book, uh, if you wanna get one from 2012 or newer. Uh, also, Ball has their information online uh, under the website of Fresh Preserving. They have very good recipes there, which can be adjusted to the volume or amount of uh, fruit that you have available. And if you buy your um, pectins in, uh, in bulk, uh, also, the So Easy to Preserve from the University of Georgia, and then the uh, USDA uh, Complete Guide to Home Canning, which is also at the University of Georgia uh, website. Uh, later on, we could, we could send you links or links available to all these sites so that you get recipes uh, to use for yourself then. Okay, next slide. Um, so how long does it... Uh, the, the products last. Canned food is, is usually good up to one year. Frozen food, three to six months for meats, fruits and vegetables up to a year. Dried fruits and meats, six months and vegetables up, up to a year. Uh, canned foods and frozen foods probably will be safe to eat after that time period, but then they start losing their nutritional um, uh, values and also you're gonna start possibly noticing some off flavor or not as fresh flavor that if you would use them within those time periods. Okay, next slide. Okay, then Karen, I guess you're, you're up. Yep, so this is the state of Wisconsin. I don't know if anyone's on that's out of Wisconsin, but I would say check with your extension um, service in your area to process at the correct temperatures. Um, follow those up-to-date research tested recipes. If you have books that are from your grandmother, your mother, your Aunt Ethel, Uncle Fred, put them in another place. Put them with your other books. That's your history. That's your family genealogy. Don't keep them with your cookbook, reference books of, of when you're doing preservation. Because we want to make sure that you're using the most current and up-to-date books, like Dave has the Blue Book um, and uh, the Ball Blue Book. And, you know, knowing those kinds of where to go for information is really important. Um, adjust for that elevation for the region where you're living. So, um, yeah, there's a couple pieces of equipment that we um, didn't talk about. David was talking about getting the air out of your um, jars. So something as simple as a plastic, I don't know if you can even see it see-through, but a plastic um, knife and putting it in the jar to get all the air bubbles out is really important. Um, sometimes people use a spatula or this is an actual little guide that I got to. It's clear plastic so it's hard to see, but you put it in the jar to make sure that you're getting all the air bubbles out so that when you're processing it, you're going to have your best product possible. So um, in terms of more information, or if you have questions that we don't answer today, um, I'm with the University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension in Adegami County. I have counterpart people that are in other counties as well, but feel free to call me. Um, my number is listed there, 920-832-5126. You can email me at karen.dickrow at wisc.edu. And if I can't answer your questions, which sometimes there are questions that are real different, I will contact and work with Barb Ingham. She's our state specialist. She's a uh, PhD extension food scientist, and she's the one that has been doing training for 20 plus years in the state of Wisconsin. She's been in the research kitchens at UW-Madison. 
She works very closely with Penn State and the University of Georgia. There's a consortium of looking at food preservation kinds of um, updates and, and new things that are coming along that need to be changed. So she is our go-to person. The website that I use a lot is www.foodsafety.wisc.edu. And um, we'll make some other um, websites available to you as well so that you know where to go to get the most current information. These publications that I held up um, are great. And when our office is open, you can get them from our office. But more and more, we're going to what's called the Learning Store. And the Learning Store is where you can go to print off our publications. So it may not have this handy dandy little picture like this, but you get the information. Anything on the Learning Store is going to be updated and have the most current. So sometimes people will call me and they'll say, I've got an extension publication from 1998, and you said it was 1994 that we should throw out. So is 1998 still good? Well, I don't know. So I sometimes have to do some comparisons of recipes because some things have been updated and have changed over time. So by going to the learning store and printing off, you know that you have the most current information. But some people like these little collector items and um, have the information and they like to mark in the books and that kind of thing. And you can print off the directions as well. Um, and it gives you different charts and different information of, of things to do for processing. So we have, um, I'll just run through quickly. We have tomatoes tart and tasty, making jams and jellies and fruit preserves, canning meat, wild game, Canning Salsa, so we have our own book on salsa and recommendations with that. Canning fruits, freezing fruits and vegetables. Canning vegetables, um, homemade pickles. And I don't know if we said this or not, David, but if you're doing any pickling and using vinegar, we have found that the last couple of years, if you buy vinegar on sale, Make sure that you're buying a food grade vinegar because now they're making vinegars that aren't 5% acidic level. So um, make sure that you're buying the kind that was made for food consumption. The other vinegars are being used for cleaning products and cleaning your house. What a concept. And then we also have Wisconsin's Wild Game. And we also have an old, old publication on making sauerkraut. Um, I don't know if you know, but Adegimi County is, I think, still the leading producer of cabbage. And so we're proud of that sauerkraut that we make. And um, it's a fermented product. So we've got the directions of how to do that. But that's all on the Learning Store site as well. So we really encourage you to um, tap the resources of the university. We're bringing research to you where you live and where you work. And now with um, Zooming all over the land, we've got people that are Zooming with us from, from other parts of, of the state maybe, and even the United States, who knows, even Canada. Um, and we just wanna make sure that you've got the correct information so that you have the safest food product available for your families for consumption. So with that, I guess if there's any questions in the chat or the questions, Jill. I have some questions. Uh, Pat wants to know, what is the best variety of grapes to grow for juice in Outagamie County? That's a master gardener question. Uh, I, could, I would say that your Concord is going to give you your best flavor, and they have grown them around here. Um, Niagara is a white grape. Uh, that also makes a good juice as, as well. Uh, there's a lot of grapes that are grown for wine. Um, they may be good for juice. I, I don't have that experience or information, but I know if you want something for juice, I would stick with either a Concord or Niagara. Okay. Deanna wants to know if a jar that has put through a hot bath, hot water bath does not seal, can you put it back in the wa water bath and try again? I wouldn't. I would take it out of the jar and start over again with a new jar and a new lid. 
Make sure that the jar is clean and sanitized. Um, that's the one time to use a dishwasher is to sanitize your jars to make sure that they're clean. But if you do it within 24 hours, it should be okay. Um, any longer than that, then it's compromised. And the other option is to put it in the refrigerator or to freeze it. Okay, is there a pressure cooker that works on induction stoves that gets to 10 pounds of pressure for beans and soups? I don't know about that. Pressure cooker. You'd have to check with the manufacturers to see what they recommend and what their heat sources are and how it works. But I don't know off the top of my head that research. Okay. If the directions on a pressure cooker recipe say, turn off heat, let canner stand undisturbed, do not remove the weighted gauge until pressure returns to zero, and you are canning on an electric stove, should you remove the PC from the stovetop or hot burner since it doesn't immediately stop heating like a gas cooktop would? If you can, just move it over. But if there's no space, then just let it um, because it's more heat, so it's not gonna damage your food product. It's just gonna heat it longer. Okay. And Lisa says, is it okay to use those mason jars in the freezer for soups and things like freezer meals? I hate to use Ziploc bags or plastic containers. For the most uh, part, yeah. yeah. David, do you wanna answer that? Yes, I use those all the time and then I'll save old lids and they're great for freezing soups and vegetables and fruits. Uh, so I use those quite a bit. Uh, they don't, you don't get the freezer burn as much because you don't get the uh, moisture drying out of it when they're in a glass container sealed with the metal lid like that. So I, I do use jars that way and it works well. I had no idea you could do that. <laughs> I always had glass and freezer. <clears throat> Can you use ball carrot? Care jars and lids for freezing. Oh, same question we just had. Yes, you just answered that. Um, where can I print these? They must be talking about the Learning Star things. Yeah, it, if you have a home computer and a printer, you can print them there. I'm not sure. Is your library open yet? Yeah, yeah. Open, like if you need to print something, we let an unlimited amount of people to come in, and you could print it there, or you could like. Send it to, we have a way you can, on our website, you can send it to the library and pick it up when you need it. Also um, the uh, Ball website, uh, when you go to their recipe page, there's a called a pectin calculator. You pick your fruit and what type of pectin you want to use and it'll give you a um, recipe that you could easily print. Usually they're about two pages and it'll give you uh, a recipe then that's anywhere from one jar to up to a maximum, I think of eight jars, meaning half pint jars for recipe sizes. And then you can measure then the exact amount of, of uh, fruit, sugar, and pectin. And if there's uh, added uh, uh, acidifier, say like lemon juice, that can be added as well. Okay. Kay would like to know, I recently canned applesauce and some applesauce came out of the jar after processing. Is this safe? Well, did they they may have overfilled the jar or overheated it and it's it just bubbled out um oh i, I mean don't it's, know if the jar sealed though yeah if it, it uh if if it happened during the heating process then that's not an issue i guess although i still would be concerned with that jar and not having a good tight seal because the applesauce leaked out with it yeah, if it was overfilled, it, there was too little of a headspace, or it was just overheated. It was just, you know, in a boiling, well, boiling bath too long. So if the product started bubbling, um, boy, I, I, I've not experienced that. Um, you know, sometimes like when you're doing salsa, uh, a little bit of the air that comes out will have some of the vinegar with it because um, you could actually smell a little of that when it's uh, af after you take them out. But that's more or less um, the gas that's in there. So it's, it's combining, it's, it's whatever volatilized in that that's coming out. That's why it's really important with products to get the air bubbles out. So using like a plastic knife or 
these little doodads that you can buy or a spatula to get, don't use metal, use plastic to get the air bubbles out. And then also to check your head space so that you haven't overfilled the jar. So that's prevention. I guess my recommendation is that to um, refrigerate it and use it if it's just one jar. Can you reuse the lids when they were only used for freezing? I would not recommend it because if you think about freezing, there, it still gets cold and then there's condensation. So that affects the, the chemicals of this seal component here. And they have changed the, the lids now. So it used to be that you should only buy your lids every, you should buy them fresh every year because the chemical would dissipate over time. But by putting it in the freezer, you're adding more liquid to it and you may not have a good seal. So I would not recommend it. The Tatler lids would work fine. And those uh, maybe, I, yeah. They when, I use, when I use lids, I use old lids that are from product that are reused. Mm -hmm. So I'm yep. not using new lids and then re reusing those or using them for canning against. What for yep. freezing, they're already old lids that I was gonna throw away anyway. Yep. And I would say also date your lids so that you know what it is. Um, and date it also, if you're gonna bring it to the, to the county fair, I forgot to say that David's an award-winning blue ribbon um, winner at the Outagamie County Fair with his gems. And I know this year we didn't have that opportunity for you. But to date your product again, because remember David was saying, things don't last forever. And so you know when you've used it. So. Um, I've repurposed my lids. Now, I've, this is my, um, if you come to the office someday when we're open again, I've got our um, website on there and phone number, and it's a magnet that you can put on your refrigerator. So these are, you can use them in a lot of uh, different ways, but I would not reuse what you used in the freezer. Do you remove rings and only leave lids after canning? It's recommended that you wait until you know that everything is settled and then you do remove the rings so that they don't rust in place. And um, probably best, like if you store everything in a closet down in the basement in a cool, dry place, take it down with the rings on. And then when you put it on the shelf, take the rings off carefully so that you don't bump the seal. Okay. Um, how do I get to the learning store? What is the site address? It's a long address. So that's what I, I hope we can send out to people or put on the website. Um, it's, it's long. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you go to Adegami Extension, the learning store should be on there as one of our tabs. Go to our website, Adegami Extension, and that's Adegami, O-U-T-A-G-A-M-I-E dot extension.wisc.edu. We have learning store as one of our buttons on there for more information and publications. Okay, we have, does temperature matter where you leave your cans? Yes, a cool dry spot is good, but not where it's gonna freeze. So sometimes people have like little um, cellars in their basements, that's fine. But um, not that it's gonna freeze. Okay. And that it's cool and dry. Um, are blue canning jars okay to use? Blue tinted. They're probably old. <laughs> and if they have the emblem on them, like David's, when he did his presentation, there was a picture of Baller Kerr. There's some other jars like Atlas is one of the names that has come up, but those are jars that are designed for canning. So if it has that on there, it's great. We don't recommend peanut and pickle jars, uh, peanut butter and pickle jars, because those are designed for one-time use and they may crack with the heat process and you've gone through all this work and then you've got your food floating in with glass and you, know, you can't really use it. So the blue ones should be fine if they're, as David had said too, check the room to make sure they're not cracked or, or chipped so that you're gonna have a good seal. And Tom added here that if you're looking for that learning store, just search learning store one word and it will be a look for a UW website. 
Okay. So I hope you get there. Thank you, Tom. It's a good tip. Um, is there a proper way of storing dehydrated fruit? Um, a dry place, you can do it in jars is fine, or in um, like Ziploc, plastic food grade um, bags is fine too. Um, some of your plastics will work too, if you have a good tight seal on it so you don't get any bugs crawling in it, because sometimes little sweet ants or whatever are attracted to those things. Uh, for my dried fruits, um, sometimes I'll freeze them, uh, oh. but most of the time I'll just put them in jars and put them in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. So again, if you if you have a defrosting freezer or a defrosting refrigerator, which most you know uh, home appliances are, uh, if you just put them in a, a even reclosal bag, reclosal freezer bag, they tend to drive out drive out some of the moisture, and your product will can get very 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 brittle, very hard then, um, or it it just lessens its, its shelf life. Is what I found. Okay, I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, someone in the chat has shared the website for the Learning Star. If those that are still here want to go there, learningstar.extension.wisc.edu. Right. Yep, okay. Well, thank you, Karen and David. This was very informative and I learned some things. <laughs> I don't can, but <laughs> mm -hmm. better prepared for those. Um, Thank you for inviting us and giving us this opportunity to get the information out and share it with your friends. Share our website with people. Please help educate others. Oh, and then all the, all, the master gardeners, all the master gardeners that are out there. Uh, hi from, from David. And if you have questions, I, I would be happy to uh, answer some. I know Tom has uh, asked a few things. However, I'm not the expert and Karen is, so I may defer it to, uh, to Karen. But if you want to share some stories of what you're doing or how you're canning, I'd be great to, uh, to talk to you about that as well. And I will try to send those out to all the people that signed up. Hopefully Zoom saves those emails for me so I can do that. <laughs> All right. So can I or can't I? Check it out. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Happy Bye. Bye. So um, you will have to end it, Karen. <laughs> or send oh, okay. Do I need to give it back to you? I think you should be able to, well, maybe it would be pretty safe if you did. Give it back to me and then I'll just. So then if you have to save anything, then it goes back to you, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Okay, well, this was great. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for including Everyone. us. Take Thanks care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.